This video is part one of a series of videos where I'm going to discuss a very important concept in chemistry being stability. And after watching this first video, you should have a fundamental understanding of how you can make qualitative predictions about the energetic and entropic stability of substances and apply that thinking to make predictions about the directionality and extent of chemical reactions. When we think about stability, we tend to think about it in two main categories. We can think about the thermodynamic stability of substances as well as the kinetic stability of substances. And I want to first focus on the thermodynamic stability of substances. Thermodynamic stability can be parsed in two categories, the energetic and entropic stabilities. And when we want to consider the energetic and entropic stabilities of substances, we can ask ourselves, how can we use this information to possibly make predictions about the directionality and extent of chemical reactions. This is a very powerful way of thinking and I want to show you how we can do this qualitatively in this video. So how do we do this? Well, what we could do is we could look for structural factors in the molecules or substances involved in the reactions that allow us to make relative predictions of the energetic and entropic stabilities that then can allow us to make overall predictions for chemical reactions. Let's start with energetic stability. We can say in general that the energetic stability of a substance increases with the decreasing potential energy of that substance. So what factors structurally may influence the potential energy of a substance? Well, as I mentioned in class, there are a number of things we can consider. We can think about the strength of the bonds and the molecules. We can think about the composition of the substance. We can consider the way the charge is distributed, the state of matter of the substance, as well as the strength of the intermolecular forces in the substance. Entropic stability refers to the possible number of configurations a system has to distribute the matter and energy it possesses. And the more possible configurations the system can access, the larger its entropy, and hence the larger its entropic stability. The factors we can use to evaluate this qualitatively are what is the state of matter of the substance? What is its relative complexity? Size and mass are factors. For example, we can say with state of matter that gases have a higher entropy than liquids and solids in general. And we can use all of these factors to evaluate increasing entropic stability when we compare two substances. Okay, let's apply this thinking to some reactions to see if we can make a qualitative prediction of the energetic and entropic favorability of processes. Let's start with this reaction right here. This is the reaction of carbon dioxide plus water to form glucose C6H12O6 and oxygen. You might recognize that this is the reverse reaction of the combustion of glucose or reaction with oxygen. So let's evaluate the entropic and enthalpic stability of the products versus reactants based on the factors that I've mentioned. Let's start with enthalpy or the energetic stability of the products versus reactants. So when we're evaluating qualitatively the potential energy of the products and reactants, we're first in molecular substances going to look at the nature of the bonds. And in general, there's a little thing we can always say is that AA bonds or bonds between same atoms tend to be weaker than AB bonds or bonds between different atoms. So if we take a look at the products and the reactants, we can see the reactants all contain AB bonds in the molecules, but we have AA bonds in the product side. So therefore, we could say that we're putting in more energy to break the stronger AB bonds of the reactant side than we get out of forming the weaker AA bonds on the product side. So if we put more energy into break bonds than we get out upon bond formation, we can predict the reaction to be energetically unfavored or endothermic. That would give us a positive sign for the enthalpy of the reaction. So this process is energetically unfavored in the direction it's written. Now let's consider the entropy change for this reaction. And when we're focusing on factors that dictate the entropy of the products versus the reactants, the first thing you can always look at are the phases involved. In particular, I, 
always suggest you focus in on the gas phase if there are any gases on the products or reactant side because gases tend to have enormous impact on the entropy of the overall system. In other words, if you form more gases or reduce the number of gases when you form products, that tends to be a dominant effect on the change in entropy for the process. So let's look here. We're going from six moles of gas on the reactant side to six moles of gas on the product side. So we can't say the amount of gas is an issue, but there are two things that should jump out at you. First, we are reacting up a liquid at the expense of forming a solid. We know that the entropy drops when we go in general from a liquid to a solid. So that would suggest a drop in entropy. Also, the six moles of gas that we're reacting is more complex in nature. CO2 is a more complicated molecule, has more degrees of freedom and more ways it can distribute energy through motion than O2, a simpler diatomic molecule. So because of the drop in complexity on going from CO2 to O2, that also lends to the process dropping in entropy on formation of the products. So we would predict qualitatively that the entropy of this process is negative. It goes down in entropy due to the formation of a solid as well as due to the reduction in complexity of the gases formed uh, in the product side. Okay, so there's that reaction. We would predict it to be energetically unfavored and entropically unfavored. And we can say with certainty then that this process will be unfavored overall. Now let's look at a couple other reactions and apply the thinking. Here's the reaction of carbon dioxide with water to form carbonic acid. And if we want to make a qualitative prediction on the energetics of this reaction or the enthalpy change, we can see that in forming carbonic acid, we are forming an additional bond here between carbon and oxygen that occurs when the two react in this fashion. We have a slight rearrangement of the hydrogens here when we form carbonic acid, but we still are maintaining two OH bonds and forming an additional carbon-oxygen interaction in the molecule. We can use that to qualitatively predict that because bond formation is energy releasing, we will predict this to be an exothermic process. If we look at the entropy change of this reaction, we see that we go from gas and liquid to aqueous. Focusing in here on the gas, whenever we take a gas and move, move it from a much less constrained environment, as it is in the gas phase, to a aqueous or dissolved state, we can make a prediction that the entropy decreases in that process. So by losing a gas at the expense of forming an, a solubilized molecule, we can predict this to be a drop in entropy for this process overall. This process is exothermic with a negative change in entropy. So, in processes like this, we cannot for sure predict whether or not it's favored, and we're going to find out that processes that have the same sign for the entropy and enthalpy are temperature-dependent processes, and we're going to get into this in later parts of these videos where we're going to quantitatively evaluate how the temperature can affect the extent and directionality of a process like this. Here is the combustion of methane, and I've drawn my little picture here showing methane being burned off a burner. And let's apply the same thinking here, first making a qualitative prediction on the energetics or the enthalpy change of this reaction. Well, we know that this reaction intuitively is exothermic, and let's verify that with the thinking that I've shown you. We can see we're going from AA bonds in the oxygen molecules to all AB bonds in the products. So we will make a prediction that we have to put less energy in to break the bonds on the reactant side than we get out upon bond formation on the product side because these types of bonds in general are weaker or of higher potential energy than these types of bonds. So we're going to make a prediction that this reaction, and we are correct of course, is exothermic, delta H is negative. It's energetically favored. Now let's evaluate the entropy change for this process. We can see here that we have three moles of gas on the reactant and three moles of gas on the product side. But one thing 
should jump out here is that we're going from a simple gas in O2, a diatomic gas, to no diatomics or simple gases on the product side. Of course, water and CO2 are simple, but they are complex compared to O2, which is a diatomic gas. So we will make a prediction, therefore, that because we are consuming simpler O2 at the expense of forming more complex H2O and CO2, we will predict the entropy change of this reaction to be positive. It's entropically favored. Therefore, we can say that this is entropically favored, the reaction is energetically favored, so we can say that this process is certainly favored, and we're not going to have to concern ourselves with a temperature dependence for the combustion of methane. I'd like to do one more example, and in this case I'm going to actually evaluate two very similar looking reactions, and I want to illustrate to you how making qualitative predictions or determining the dominant factors for energy and entropy changes in reactions can be challenging sometimes, and this is going to hopefully set the stage for showing that we need to quantify, in many cases, the actual energetic changes and entropy changes in chemical reactions. Let's start with this top reaction here, which is copper 1 sulfide plus oxygen going to copper metal plus SO2. Let's start with enthalpy. If we take a look at this, we can see that we have AA bonds on the reactant side, and we're forming AB bonds, at least in the formation of SO2. Well, we also see that we're going from an ionic compound to a metallic compound. In general, ionic interactions tend to be stronger than metallic interactions. So moving from an ionic compound to a metallic compound would lend towards the process potentially being endothermic, whereas going from AA bonds in oxygen to AB bonds in SO2, or nonpolar to polar, would lend towards this process being exothermic. So which one is dominant? It turns out this process is actually exothermic. So we can say overall that the AA to AB bonds in going from O2 to SO2 seems to be the dominant factor here. Another thing to remember is that in copper sulfide, we have lower charged ions, plus one copper ions and minus two sulfide ions. And so that makes the coulombic interactions here weaker and therefore the energy difference between the attractive forces and the ionic compound here might not be as great when I compare that to metallic copper. Okay, let's move on to entropy. Now, when we want to make an entropy prediction here, we first will look at the gases, and I can see here that I'm going from O2 to SO2. O2 is a simple homonuclear diatomic gas, and SO2 is a more complex gas, so that would for sure lend to an increase in entropy overall. But if I evaluate the solids here, I can see that I'm going from one mole of an ionic compound, where I have interactions that are plus one, minus two, but I have more diversity, to two moles of a simple elemental substance. Well, the fact that I'm going from a compound that is more diverse, which can allow for more possible configurations that can be accessed, to a simple elemental compound that is structurally less diverse, that lends to the, the system moving towards lower entropy, and it turns out that this reaction has a negative delta S. So that seems to be the dominant factor the movement from ionic compound Cu2S to simple elemental uh, metallic copper. Okay, let's now apply the same thinking to the next reaction. This is the reaction of copper oxide plus carbon monoxide to form calcium solid and carbon dioxide gas. Let's start with energetics. If we take a look here, we can see that we're going from an ionic compound where the interactions are between plus two calcium and minus two oxide ions. Those are slightly higher charged ion pairs than of course we have up here. So the Coulombic attractive forces are stronger here. And so since we're breaking stronger ionic interactions to move to weaker in general metallic interactions in the calcium metal, we would predict possibly that this reaction is endothermic, and it turns out it is endothermic. 
Now, let's move on to the entropy change. We can see we go from one mole of carbon monoxide gas to one mole of carbon dioxide gas. That's an increase in complexity, so that lends to the entropy increasing. Now, we are moving from a more complex ionic compound to a simple elemental compound. But in this case, it turns out the entropy change is positive. And there's two things that are lending to this. One was what I just mentioned. We're moving to a more complex gas in CO2. But also, as the Col Coulombic forces are stronger between the ions, that creates a more constraining environment for the ions in a substance like calcium oxide. If we actually look at the molar entropy of calcium oxide versus calcium metal, we find that this has a lower molar entropy than calcium metal, which implies that even though this is a simpler element in its appearance, that the weaker interactive forces between the calcium atoms in calcium metal lend to more degrees of freedom for motional ways to distribute energy and overall a slightly higher molar entropy. So you can see that comparing factors can become challenging in making decisions about which one is dominant. And again, we're now going to have to move on to quantifying these values to make predictions about the extent of reactions by combining the energetic and entropic stability. So this concludes these four examples in my initial discussion of the qualitative factors you can use to make predictions about the energetic and entropic stability of substances and hence reactions. In part two, I'm going to discuss quantitative approaches to evaluating the directionality and extent of chemical reactions.